Welcome to this morning's briefing, America's Opioid Epidemic, A Role for Technology. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsor, Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, for making today's conversation possible. Technology is fast becoming a key tool for prescribers, pharmacists, payers, and the government in the nation's response to the opioid crisis. While leaders in Congress are currently trying to move legislation that will require electronic prescriptions for controlled substances under Medicare, several states have already put in place mandatory e-prescriptions. What are the other ways in which data and technology are being harnessed to tackle the epidemic, and what is being done to encourage information sharing for a co coordinated national response? We're looking for answers to all of these questions this morning. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. In addition to our audience here, we're live streaming on thehill.com slash events. Please keep your phones on silent. However, we do encourage you to engage in the discussion on social media. You can follow us on Twitter using the hashtag tackling opioids with tech and uh, following at the Hill events. We're going to be taking questions from the audience, so please be on the lookout for members of our team with handheld mics. Finally, there's a short feedback survey on each of your chairs, and we'd uh, encourage you to fill those out as we would love to hear from you about our events. So let's dive right in. We begin with Congressman Tim Ryan. His home state of Ohio is second only to West Virginia in the number of opioid deaths related, uh, related deaths across the country. A member of the House Appropriations Committee, Congressman Ryan advocates uh, for a comprehensive approach to dealing with the epidemic and has been leading efforts in Congress to provide more funding and resources to those at the front lines. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to, con to Congressman Tim Ryan. Joining him on stage is my colleague, The Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Cusack. Bob, over to you. Thanks, Diana. Thanks for doing this, uh, Congressman. I, I want to start off with just news of the day uh, on immigration. It's dominated the headlines. Um, there was a big meeting on Capitol Hill with Let me put my coffee down. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah <laughs> take a deep breath. Yeah. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, there's going to be a couple immigration bills on the, the, the House floor uh, tomorrow, it looks like. Um, but you have this, you, we're seeing more visuals of, of the kids at the border. Uh, what's the solution? What's going to happen? Uh, certainly, we've talked to some Republicans who want this out of the headlines. Yeah, well, I, I can imagine. The president has the power to solve this problem right now. This morning, with the stroke of a pen, he needs to do it. My concern is that. You know, he, he wants this to happen. I, I really think that he wants immigration to be an issue in the fall. He thinks that it helps Republicans. It motivates their base. This is his thinking. Uh -huh. And that he wants it to be an issue. And I, you know, I hate to be that cynical about it, but when you see what's happening on TV and you see that he has the power to do something and the most powerful person in the world is not doing anything, it's hard not to think cynically about what's happening. And, and the real concern I have, too, is that now they're reporting up to 1,300 to 1,500 kids that, that are already separated and they're not talking about, they're not paying attention to. I don't trust this administration to know how to get them back with their parents. And I, I just think this is a, an appalling, appalling display by our president. I mean, you think, anybody in here, you want to be president? You're president for a day. What are you going to do? Right? I'm going to fix poverty. I'm going to make peace. I'm going to invest in communities. I'm going to jobs. that you going know, to separate kids from their parents? Like, that's what you're going to do? It's just, I mean, it's disgusting. And I, I'm not a firebrand. I try to get along. But this is just beyond what we should accept as a country. Now, House Republicans say that the uh, pending two bills would change and would do a lot of, a lot of changes to immigration law. Um, do you think those bills are going to pass? Th uh, they may. I don't know. But there's so many other things in it. I'm not inside on the negotiations, but they're talking about other issues within the context of immigration that are controversial, right. which are going to hold the whole thing up. And so, again, if they're really interested in just solving the problem, they need to solve the immediate problem and then have a, a broader discussion about what's going on with immigration later. 
Um, but don't, you know, let's, let's talk about abortion. Let's talk about the death penalty. Let's throw some other more controversial things in here so we can say we, we, it's stuck. This is what I'm saying. I think the president is making a cal political calculation here that he wants immigration to be an issue and he wants us to be in the headlines. He thinks he can benefit from it. He thinks it's going to motivate his base in an off year election. And, you know, Republicans got to step up and say it's unacceptable. And from what I saw yesterday in their caucus meeting, they're applauding them. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not a good sign. Um, on the opioid e epidemic, big picture before we get into legislation and, and what's going on in Capitol Hill is, you know, what are you seeing? What's the big picture? Uh, where are we? What are you seeing on the ground in your district? Well, it's still a, a major, major issue. We still have massive levels of overdoses all over um, my community in Ohio, for sure, is one of the top states. And, you know, you can't really have a conversation today with somebody without, you know, go back to the district or go, you know, out and about. Uh, even last night, there were people in town from, uh, from back home, and it was like, hey, did you hear so-and-so's brother overdosed? Did you hear so-and-so's cousin overdosed? Oh, did you hear about the kid we went to school with? I mean, it's always um, something, and it's still an issue. And I think it's, to me, you know, we've got to get the economics right. And this is something that kind of gets lost. We'll talk about prescription drug monitoring. We'll right. talk about some of these other, you know, the, the technology and how can it help and all the other things we've been doing. But the reality of it is these opiates, they relieve uh, physical pain, but they also relieve emotional pain. And when you live in a time of hopelessness economically, you're falling behind. You see all the stats coming out. The United Way had a study that came out a couple of weeks ago, 43% of Americans can't meet the basic necessities of life, food, you know, clothing, housing, a phone, and, you know, 43%. I mean, that's, you know, 50% of people can't withstand a $500 emergency. I mean, people are squeezed, and it's been going on for a long time. And I think if you get hurt and you don't have a job paying 40 or 50 bucks an hour, and benefits, and you want to go fishing with your kids on the weekend, and you have a good life, mm -hmm. you're in a lot of pain, and then you get hurt at work, and you start taking something that's relieving that pain, and you're making 12 bucks an hour now. All of a sudden, I think, you know, we, we start relieving that pain and puts us where we are today. And I think that's the underlying thing that we don't really talk about enough. And, and I mean, within the, the Beltway, there's a lot of talk, and the unemployment rate is uh, the lowest in 44 years, I believe. Um, the narrative is the economy is booming, but you're not, you're seeing a lot of people left behind. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, if you've got money in the stock market, you know, you're doing pretty well. If you're in the top 5 or 10% of the people in the country, you're doing pretty well. Wages are stagnant for everybody else and have been for a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, debt's high. Pensions are insecure. You know, back home, our General Motors plant uh, in the last 18 months has lost two shifts. Best job in, you know, outside of Youngstown, Ohio. An auto worker job is the best job going. That's a quick, just a quick story. So I'm in Youngstown the other day, periodically. I just go with the, like a council person and I go and visit. Uh -huh. um, and so we were driving around the south side of Youngstown. So we go see a woman, um, Mrs. Duke, and we go into her house. And it's an older house. But it's really nice. And as we walk up to go see her, she's got this little spray bottle in her hand. She's spraying for ants. Like, this is how meticulous she is with her home. Her son was there. He had white paint on his arm. He was painting the door. Really took care of it. And she went on to say drugs, prostitution. She can't have a cold glass of water at night when it gets dark. You know, it used to be a beautiful neighborhood. Her husband was a sheriff's deputy. Um, Long story short, she was trying to sell her house. So she had her son go look how much she could get for it. Uh -huh. $4,000, okay? $4,000. That is the level of hopelessness that she doesn't know what to do. I mean, she's literally trapped. And now there are millions of Americans that are in that very same situation. And people say, well, go move to Silicon Valley. I mean, go where the jobs are. This, you could sell a house in Youngstown for four grand and go to move to, you know, uh, Mountain View. How much is a house in Mountain View? I mean, you can't get a cup of coffee in Su Silicon Valley for $4,000. I mean, it's, <laughs> and, and so that, I, I, just, I just want people to understand 
the level of anxiety and hopelessness that's out in some of these communities. And that's, that's just one example of many. Um, this, this problem is going to be with us for, for many years. Uh, that's, that's clear, and a lot of the experts say that the problem has gotten worse, not better. Um, so let's talk about solutions. You mentioned the Prescription Drug Monitoring Act. You sponsored legislation on that. Uh, the House is actually acting on a lot uh, of this, uh, but it's not, not attracting headlines because other, other issues are. Um, but uh, what are some of the solutions? Where's the role of technology, e-prescribing? Uh, what role can that play in, in tackling this huge epidemic. Yeah, again, it's one one piece of the puzzle. So you know, you obviously have the law enforcement. You need to deal with the treatment, the recovery, the overdose uh, issue, um, the law enforcement uh, issue, the prevention issue. Um, this is one piece of really trying to create some transparency so that that people know. So our bill, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Act, um, will allow enforce, if you want to get federal funding, um, force uh, prescribers to tell us within 24 hours that they're prescribing Schedule 2, 3, or 4 uh, drugs and let make sure everybody knows what's going on and then have the state has the ability to then come in and say, okay, there's, there's an issue over here with a controlled substance. There's maybe some bad news going on over here. Just a better, more comprehensive way. And then to get it across states. That's really the key, too, because you take a state like Ohio, next to Pennsylvania, next to West Virginia, next to Michigan. I don't like to admit we're next to Michigan, but we are. Um, it's a football thing. Um, um, in Indiana, and so if you're not, if you're not communicating cross-border, then you're really behind the eight ball and trying to fix the problem. Um, there's a lot of partisanship in Washington. Some would say that we're in the most polarizing time ever. Uh, the House has been a partisan body really since the beginning of time. Um, <laughs> how is that different on opioids? And we, we saw a vote last night, uh, 356 to 3 on opioids. Um, you know, uh, are there relationships forming in the House on this issue? I think so. Evan Jenkins, who I work with, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of bipartisan support on these issues. And I think because it's hitting, you know, it's not hitting New York, just New York City or uh -huh. just Los Angeles. It's hitting Southern Ohio. It's hitting West Virginia. And so um, it's hitting Kentucky. So you're getting a lot of red state members of Congress who are going back to their districts and really living with this every single day. And so I think that's driving a lot of the, the need. We're going to open it up uh, to questions in a couple minutes. We'll have people with microphones. Um, I, I do want to ask you, how would you grade the Trump administration on opioids? Uh, I would say a C. Why? Not enough money. I mean, we really, y you can pass all the legislation you want, but if, if only 20% of the people who need treatment are getting it, we're way low-balling, like really addressing this problem. And you know, we have a bill that says the need's probably about 10 billion, maybe a year. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, a, that's something that we need to do. And so it's great to have the legislative fix, but at the same time, if you're not putting the dough behind it, you're going to have a problem. And then this is all in the context of, you know, like the tax bill. Uh -huh. You know, we're going to end up borrowing about $2.3 trillion at the end of the day um, for the tax bill. So I think we've got to make calculations as a country. Was that worth it? Or funding some of these other priorities taking care of the neighborhood that Mrs. Duke lives in, taking care of a lot of the issues that people in this room care about, having the resources to be able to do that. That's a policy question. That's an investment question. But I don't think you can get past to see if you're not going to put the amount of revenue you need into it, investment you need. Do you think if, the how, if Democrats won back the House, they would repeal parts of the tax law? I would hope the top uh, brackets, um, you know, some of the the tax cuts that went primarily to the top, you know, one, two, three, four, five percent at least for starters, um, and, and you know it's it's one of these discussions. You know, it's like we're in an either-or society, right? So, if you want to ask people who have had the highest corporate earnings in a generation and highest level of income inequality since the Great Depression, if you ask those people to pay more, you actually hate rich people. I don't, I don't hate rich people. I love rich people, and I'd like to be a rich person one day. <laughs> but the reality of it is you have to balance that with the investments we need to make in the United States. And, and so I think 
asking them to pay more, but then also showing them that we're going to run a tight ship. And I'm not for throwing money at, at, at problems. You know, we've got to reform government. I mean, that right now we waste about $50 billion a year in waste, fraud, and abuse in the Medicare program. We've got to attack that. Uh -huh. There's a lot of waste in the Medicaid program. We need to attack that. There's a lot of waste in the Defense Department. We need to attack that. So yeah, we need money, but we also have to prove to whether you're a rich or a middle class person paying taxes, we're going to run a tight ship. We, and Democrats don't talk enough about that. We want, if you want government to work, if we want people to invest in the programs, damn it, we got to make them work and we got to make them efficient. So it's got to be both, but I think, I think we would and because we're projected to have trillion dollar deficits starting in the next year or two. Yep. We open up for questions. We've got a few minutes left. If you can raise your hand and then identify yourself. Uh, I want to pick this gentleman in the front with a tan suit on because he has the courage <laughs> to wear a tan suit. I appreciate it. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He called you out. I'm just kidding. Uh, Someone told me I had my tan suit on. And they, you know, the whole Obama. Uh, the tope. Yeah, Obama tope. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. So. You know, someone said, you can't really wear that. I said, why not? They said, well, Obama wore it once. They made fun of him, and he stopped wearing it. Right. So I said, I'm from Youngstown. If you'd make fun of me, I'd wear it seven days in a row just to prove <laughs> you wrong. <laughs> yeah. Obama did back down. Actually. Yes, he did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, right here in the front, if you can wait for a mic to come up and then identify yourself and uh, uh, ask your question. Thank you for, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Steve Scroggs. I'm with Beacon Health Options, a national behavioral health company. Um, it does seem like there's more of a bipartisan agreement like what you're talking about, except maybe the funding aspect for the opioid crisis. But the basis, the fundamental basis that you talked about, about the uh, lack of, of income for a lot of the folks and this whole sort of hopelessness and, and the relief of pain and that type of thing, the lack of compromise, let's just say after these coming up elections that the Democrats got control of both houses, let's just say that happened. Um, do you see a time where we can actually, if the Democrats were in control, that they would have the courage to actually pull something off the dusty shelf like uh, Simpson Bowles? Remember Simpson Bowles that came out at the beginning in 2008 that nobody liked? Republicans thought, you know, it, uh, there was too much spending in it. And uh, the Democrats didn't like it because it dealt with entitlement programs. And so you end up having this pendulum back and forth with that allows two different candidates on both the left and the right to suddenly come out because neither party is really meeting the needs of America, not making our system work. Are we just stuck as long as we have gerrymandering and everything else to these extremes? And doesn't that bode poorly for the future of our country. You know, I'm an eternal optimist. Um, that's my greatest flaw as a human being. Um, that we, we can do this. I mean, the great thing about elections is we all get stuck in a mindset like we are today, I think, with everything that's going on. Like, oh my god, it's going to be like this forever. You know, I was around when President Bush was in, and we were at war, and we never thought we'd, you know, like, get sanity back and why'd we go and it was all cooked up and all that and then 06, 08 we took over, I mean then the financial collapse so I think every, that's the beautiful thing about living in a democracy, you can always replenish every two years, every four years and kind of re hit the reset button and I'm hoping that we can do that and I, I think you bring up a really good point and kind of what I was talking about, about the making government run smoothly. We've got to address these long-term uh, deficit issues. We are borrowing money right now, and we're borrowing it from China. And if anyone hasn't noticed, China has a pretty comprehensive whole of government plan to take down the United States of America, and they're doing a hell of a good job. And if you don't think they are, when they just told their uh, head of government that we're going to get rid of term limits, you can stay in forever, that's a pretty good validator that you're doing a good job, that they're going. And they're going with a 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 year plan. We're in a 24 hour news cycle and they're kicking our rear end all over the world. And deficits are a big part of that because we borrow the money from them. So not only are we competing with them, we're borrowing money from them. That's really stupid. 
And so moving forward, we've got to have that kind of comprehensive approach where we say we've got to balance the budget, we've got to stop borrowing money, we've got to ask, I think, the wealthiest to pay more to help us not only pay our deficits down, but also make these critical investments that China is making in artificial intelligence, additive manufacturing, wind, solar, space, aerospace, on and on and on, all kinds of technologies. So we've got to do both. I mean, if we're going to stay the premier economy and the premier military and kind of shape the globe around democracy, we've got to do both. And I hope, my hope is that the Democratic Party, a, a new version of the Democratic Party, because our brand right now still isn't where I'd like it to be, that a new version would focus on something like this. We've run out of time. Please uh, thank the congressman. Uh, thank you. We covered thank some you. ground. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Appreciate, Appreciate it. it.